Jack Benny used to greet his audiences with Jello again. But our guest today could have greeted his audiences with Jello again. Were there a doctorate's degree in comedy, this man would certainly hold one. Please join us in welcoming the unique and legendary Maury Amsterdam. Your man of the half hour, Skippy Low. Show business. When I use the word show business, and anyone uses that word show business, the only thing I can come up with, and with that word, Maury Amsterdam. Well, you haven't been around very much, evidently. Why? What do you mean that's the only one? No, no, I know there's oh, a lot. Come on, I've had some wonderful but, people. How about Jack Benny? How about George? Yeah, but Burns? you started about... with these people. You've been in vaudeville with these people. I'm that's going right. back, but you're one of these people. That's what I mean, Maury. Oh, well, you want me I to go mean... out and come back in again? No. All right. But San Francisco. That's my hometown. Great city. Went all through school there. Went to University of California across the bay. Uh huh. And. Uh, uh, incidentally, if I'm a little nervous today, there's a reason for it. I'm a little upset. I showed the landlord my lottery ticket, and he made me pay the rent anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I, I'm not kidding. I was listening to, to the radio coming down to the studio here. Right. And you know what upset me? Have you been listening to the news, this thing about this Yamaguchi, you know, the girl skater? Terrible. Isn't that awful? Yes. My God, if you can look into people's backgrounds, we'd have to start with an Indian. There's been no Indian in the, in the Olympics. Why? That girl is marvelous. Just because her ancestry is, is Japanese, or she's part Japanese, that never stopped anybody. I'm glad you brought that up, Henri, because our country is really in trouble. I'm, I'm just digressing right now. Tall up our, here. Tall up here. Is it? Uh, yeah. Maury Amsterdam, 14 years old. Yeah. Vaudeville, singer, come on, with your brother, Ted. Started How'd with you, your brother? What, what, made you, what difference does that make? How I started? I started in show business at an accident anyway. No, it didn't. Yes, Come on. it did. Your brother, 14. No, Tell me. I know, but before that, my father being the concert master of the symphony right. and all of our family being musicians, I turned out to be the black sheep. I'm the one making money. See? But they wanted you to be a concert. A concert cellist, that's yes, right. Right. But uh, how it all happened that I got into comedy, I was never the funny kid around the house or right. the funny kid in school. Uh -huh. My mother was a funny one in the family. Uh -huh. And uh, my brother, who was eight years older than I was, when he graduated high school, he went out with a vaudeville act as the musical director for the Flash Act. Right. Do you remember what a Flash Act was? Uh, yeah, I that do. That was when, at the end of the show, when all of the acts would get together and do what was like a, like a little musical comedy. Right, right. And everybody would perform. And he was not only the musical director by the time he came back home, right. he was a straight man for the comic in the act. Right. And the comic got sick. So who does he recruit? Me. I'd never been on the stage in my life. And you were 14 or 12? How old 14. 14, And he Maureen. said to me, uh, well, don't be nervous. I said, what do you mean, don't be nervous? He said, all those people out there in the audience, they paid to get in. You're seeing the show for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so I swear that's the truth. Uh -huh. I never forgot it. Uh -huh. And... Uh, I, I think I, I was talking to a couple of your boys here, a right. producer and his assistant. Now, taking into consideration what the producer does on the show, the assistant can't be doing too much. <laughs> See, we were in the, in the green room. Uh -huh. I think here it's the yellow room. But anyway, uh, my brother came back and he insisted we do the act. So, right. And he taught me the other, the man's, the comic in comic, the act. He right. taught me his act. Uh -huh. So we did it for a few weeks. The man got well. We gave him his act back, and I decided I liked show business. Uh -huh. So my brother and I paid a man. To, would you believe it? James Madison was his James name. James Madison. Same as the president's right. name. And he used to come out with a book for vaudeville performers called Madison's Budget. Uh -huh. And he'd have all these new jokes and stuff in it. Right. And so we went to him and paid what you know those days was fantastic. Uh -huh. $500 to write an act for us. Wow. Uh -huh. That was like 50000 today. Well, evidently the act wasn't too good because we opened at the White Theater in Fresno, California. Right. And we were so bad that the manager came back after the show. He says, I ought to throw you two guys out on your uh -huh. behinds. Uh -huh. He says, but I, he happened to know my father and mother. You can stay on. 
you do a musical act. Uh -huh. You just keep playing your cello, and your brother plays the piano, and you sing a couple of songs, and you can stay on for the rest of the week. Uh -huh. It's all true stories. Now, about the third day, I'm sitting there playing a cello, and I get a little itchy, and I start throwing some lines. I don't know where they came from, I just, and the audience was laughing. And we get off the stage, and my brother said, where'd you get those lines? I said, I made them up. He says, make up some more. And that started me, and from then on, I suddenly became a comedian. That became Maury Amsterdam, starting that writing. That's Because right. you wrote for presidents. I wrote you for You wrote for Milton Berle. You have written for Henny Youngman. I wrote Jackie Gleason's uh, radio show, Did too, you really? also. Yeah. But let's get back. Fanny After Bryce. Let's Fanny not forget Bryce. Fanny was one of my dear friends. Where, did you write for her? Yeah, I wrote for Fanny, too. How did you write for Fanny? What well, do you, you remember a show called the MGM Good News Show when we used all the big MGM stars? Right. Well, I used to write love scenes for her to do with our guest stars and uh -huh. all that. And uh, she was a wonderful lady. Was she really? On Sundays, we used to go out to Malibu and sit on the pier and fish. And she would tell me stories about the old days with Ziegfeld and she told me something I never knew. She says, Ziegfeld did not like comedians. He just used them as a necessity while his beautiful Ziegfeld girls right. changed costumes. So he liked the Ziegfeld girls. Yeah. How about but, Will Rogers? Did he like Will Rogers? Will, oh, everybody liked Will Rogers. You wrote for him also? Yes, and I'll tell you how it happened. And maybe, well, this goes back to 19... Oh, I believe it was about nine, in the early 40s. Right. And Will was booked into the Low State Theater here in downtown Los Angeles. Right. And the money he was making for the two weeks, which in those days was considered fantastic, mm -hmm. he was getting $25,000 for the two weeks, which he turned over to the community chest. Mm -hmm. Now, here's how we became friends. In those days, the actors, I don't know if it still works, you know where your dressing room was, don't you? A nail. <laughs> that's right. That's how the young man's joke. I, I, yeah. That's right. But, but in those days, we had nothing in the uh -huh. room. We had a mirror, we had a little shelf, right. and a chair, and a cot, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and a wash basin. Right. No toilet, just a right. wash basin. Uh -huh. That's why the actors got used to using it for all occasions. Uh -huh. Now, we had everybody, <laughs> we had one toilet on each floor. Mm -hmm. Now, Will Rogers is in the room next to me. Uh -huh. And we had a toilet, when you flushed it, You'd imagine that the building was falling down. You never heard such noise. The whole building choked like uh -huh. it was an earthquake. Uh -huh. So I went down to the stage manager and said, I want you to paint a sign for me. And I, I had him paint it, and I hung it up opposite the toilet. Uh -huh. What do you think I had on the sign? It says, if you are constipated, flush the toilet first. It'll scare the you-know-what uh -huh. out of you. Uh -huh. Well, Will comes in, and he goes in there, and he gets hysterical. Uh -huh. He said, who put that sign up? Uh -huh. And the stage manager says, Maury. A, well, from then on, we were buddies. Uh, oh, he was a great guy. You know what we used to do between shows? What? We'd go down on Spring Street and watch the old cowboy movies. He loved cowboy movies. And Bob Steele, whose uh -huh. father later was the chief of police in San Francisco, uh -huh. Bob Steele was his favorite. He says, he's the world's greatest cowboy uh -huh. actor. He says, how do you know? He said, the only one can see the bullets coming. <laughs> I said, what are you talking about? He says, watch this next scene and hear the bad guys chasing uh -huh. the good guys. Uh -huh. Then he looks over and he sees the bad guy's got a gun pointed at him, and he goes like this as if he's going to let the bullet go by him. Uh huh. Maury Amsterdam, first time you did your act as a kid, yeah. throwing this material around on stage. Well, were, you Wait, were you surprised of yourself I doing that? Yeah, I was surprised at myself getting You laughed. had this talent, this yeah. wonderful talent of. And then I wrote for other acts too, and some of the acts, I'd see their act and I'd say, you know what you could use here? Change this and put a line and say, ah, eh, kid, what does he know? These same people came to me later and paid me a lot of money to write acts for them. Uh -huh. Who are some of the favorites that you used to like to write when you used to watch them work? Well, I loved Fanny Bryce. I loved Frank Morgan. Oh, I love Frank Morgan. Robert Taylor, whom I knew when he was still in college in Pomona University. Right. His right name was Arlington Bro, I think you pronounced the last name. And he also played cello. And I used to Robert my, Taylor? Yeah, I used to take my cello up there and we'd sit there and play duets. Uh -huh. He was a terrific guy. Was he really? You'd be surprised at people who play cello. You know that Prince Charles is a cello player? I didn't know that, no. Yeah. Well, you see, did you, you meet Prince Charles? Did, like you meet me. pro did you no. meet Prince Charles No, play? I did not meet, but I know... You've got to get together to play. Does he know that you play? Yes, he does. He does. But I did meet the, uh, the Duke of Edinburgh. Uh -huh. A lovely, lovely guy. Uh -huh. When you did your act as, as, a, as Maury Amsterdam, a comedian on Chicago theaters and all those theaters... I played all the but theaters. All, yes, Chicago. I know you did. you did. But you came out with your cello. That's that cello, right. because you, you stayed with that cello, That's and right. you tell jokes with that cello. Yeah. Tell me about that. 
What made you stay with that child? Because this girl, as your father, wanted you to be a Not concert. only that reason, another reason I tried to please my father was about no matter where I was playing, working anywhere in the world, when I came home to San Francisco, he had a little uh, string quartet at the Sir Francis Drake Hotel. Right. I would sit there and play in the string quartet with him for a couple of weeks just to keep him happy. You know, oh. people would walk by and they say, "I know that guy's from someplace." You know. <laughs> I used to see you at Chicago Theater. I, I played at Chicago Theater. The you were just all, all, and I played every theater in New York. Yeah. All of the the uh, big movie houses. Who's some of the favorite stars that you? worked with that you really enjoyed working with Henny, uh, Henny Youngman. I mean, Henny Youngman was great though. Henny, I, uh, I gave Henny jokes in 1935, which he is still doing. <laughs> did Milton Berle steal his jokes that you wrote? No, I was writing for Milton. You did? Yeah, I wrote uh, his show and this, this goes way back. I must tell you a story. Yes. Do you know that at one time Milton and Charles Lawton did a radio show together? Did not know this. But I'm not talking about one week. They were on the air for Olympia Beer Milton and they hated Berle? each other. Uh -huh. They just didn't like, they didn't get along at all because Lawton wanted to read from the Bible and Milton wanted to tell jokes. Uh -huh. So they didn't get along, they were always arguing. And finally one day I said, Milton, I love you, but I said, I can't, I just don't like people fighting. Uh -huh. I'm a very peaceful fellow. Uh -huh. And I quit, and that's when I went to work for MGM as a writer. As a writer at MGM? Yeah. But they did a show for you. They wrote a special show on Broadway for you, didn't they? Tell me about that special show. I had show. a show called Maury Amsterdam's Hilarities. That's it. What it really was was a glorified vaudeville show. Okay. And uh, you see, I had been on the air like four or five times a day. And when I would he see a bad review of a show, I'd go to see it. And if I liked it, I'd make a bad review of the writer, of the, the uh, columnist, uh, because they were just trying, most of them tried right. to be wise guys. I'm talking about people like Haywood Brune and a lot of those big uh, uh -huh. critics in New York. Now I'm opening in my own show, and I said to my wife, and I said to my, my radio audience, uh -huh. these guys are going to pan me like you never heard. Uh -huh. And sure enough, they all did, and I read every one of the pans on the air. Right. See? You did it right on the air. Right. Right. I, even <laughs> di I even did it in the, uh, uh -huh. on the stage. Uh -huh. I walked out, I said, I want you people to see some of the wonderful reviews uh -huh. I got. And I take a page, I read, New Jersey Clarion, Maury Amsterdam, a great show. Uh -huh. uh, uh, Yonkers News, Maury Anthem. Finally, I'd come to one that says New York uh, Daily, <laughs> New York, uh, what was it? The Daily number News? One, the, uh, no, no, the number one. Uh, Mirror? No, no, it wasn't. The number Mirror. one newspaper in New York. Anyway, I tear it off and throw it away. I said, right. ah, who reads the Times? Oh, I see. <laughs> New York Times. Maury Amsterdam, right. you've written for presidents. Yeah. Who some of the presidents have you written for? Well, I go back to a man named Franklin D. Roosevelt and. Uh, Johnson, Dr. Uh, President Johnson. President Johnson. How about Kennedy? Kennedy. Did anything? Yes. Yeah, we were very good friends. Were you good friends? Yeah, very good friends, and it happened by accident. I was appearing in, uh, uh, well, not 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 in Boston. It actually, it was in Hyannisport. Right. They had a melody tent there. Yes, I and know. During the summer. Uh huh. Oh, you're from Massachusetts. Well, no, I I worked a lot of it. Well. I went to school. I went to school at Andover. Oh. Go ahead. Well, then anyway. We're there, and I said to my wife, gee, I'd love to play golf up here. Mm -hmm. And I had a reciprocate of a card from my golf club. Uh -huh. So I went out there, and they said, sure. I called first. They said, sure, you can play here. I go out there, and my wife dropped me off. And I walk in the pro shop. I said, what happens here? He says, nobody playing golf on this course. He says, hang around a few minutes. Somebody will show up. Uh -huh. So two men come up, one named uh, Bradley. Right. And at that time, he was with, I think, Business World or something. He is now the editor of the, uh, of the big paper in the Washington, D.C., uh -huh. Washington Post. Post. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, he told me something interesting. He lived next door to the Kennedys, and they used to babysit for each other. Did they really? Yeah, he uh -huh. and, and Br Ben Bradley. Uh -huh. And uh, anyway, I, did, I said, come on, fellas, let's play. I said, there's only three of us. Uh -huh. He said, don't worry, Jack will be here any minute. Mm -hmm. And as he said it, up comes Jack Kennedy, and he looks at me and says, what are you doing here? He said, I thought you get killed in the movie last night. Uh -huh. Now we're out on the golf course, and he talked to his assistant. I said, Jack, if you become president, he was still senator then. Uh -huh. I said, then I'll be a little more respectful. Uh -huh. But I said, please just keep your mouth shut when I'm trying to hit. Uh -huh. And he laughed about it. And one day I said to him, uh, Jack, I said, uh, no, he th said to me first, he said, have uh -huh. you ever seen me on the screen in the nude reels and stuff? Uh -huh. I said, yeah. He said, what do you think? Well, I said, I'm, are you just trying to make conversation or be nice to me? No, he said, I really mean it. 
Well, I said, I've got to tell you something. I have seen you. Well, he said, I've seen myself, and I don't like the way I come over. <laughs> and I said, just because you're the youngest guy who ever looked for the job, uh -huh. I said, what do you care if the women vote for you? As long as they, if they say you're cute, as long as they vote for uh -huh. you. Uh -huh. Well, anyway, we get in this big conversation. He says, tomorrow, there's a labor leader from New Orleans coming up. Right. And I'm, all the newspaper guys will be there and interviewing me with him. Uh -huh. So I go. And all during the interview, he sent his car over for me. My wife wouldn't go. She uh -huh. regressed it to this day because she said her hair didn't look right. Uh -huh. You know, women. <laughs> so anyway, we were, uh, he asked me if I'd seen him, and I told him. And I said, Jack, you're, you know, just what, what I told right. you. So he's come to this thing. All during this interview with the newspaper reporters, uh -huh. every time a reporter would throw a question at him and he'd answer, it took him so long to do it. He, and he'd look over at me, and I'd go, <laughs> Finally, he stopped. He came and he said, what are you doing this for? Uh -huh. I said, Jack, you're bugging the newsmen. Uh -huh. I said, he said, what do you mean I'm bugging the newsmen? I said, they ask you a question, and it takes you 20 minutes to come up with an answer. <laughs> well, he said, that's my New England background. I just don't talk unless I have something, something to, say. to say. Right. Say, I said, yeah, well, meanwhile, the other guy is going to be, he says, uh, he's, I, would, I don't remember how I presented it to him, but I said, the other guy is going to win while you're trying uh -huh. to think of an answer. Uh -huh. And he says, well, what do I do? I said, remember when we were playing golf the other day, you said to me, you got a big kick out of seeing me on many shows when I walk through the audience, right. and I do a joke about any name, subject, or article they call out? Right. I said, how many times do you think somebody will call out something I never heard of? Uh -huh. Never thought I had never written a joke about it, never knew it. But I said, the minute the question comes out, you start talking. Right. And while the garbage is coming out, you think of what you want to say, and it's there, and people say, wow. What a clever guy. Right, well, he's right. got him right at his fingertips. So you gave him some good ideas. Yeah, well, wait a minute. I said, uh -huh. you got to do the same thing. He said, what do you mean? Let's say one of the guys yells out civil rights. And at that point, you had never even heard those two words, didn't know what it was about. Right. The minute that comes out of his mouth, number one on my agenda, you got to throw it out. I've got men working at night, committees, trying to figure out there's got to be an answer for this thing. Uh -huh. And while all that, while the wheels right, are right, grinding, right. you'll come out with what you want to say. Did you happen to see his debate with, uh, with Nixon? Uh -huh. He was marvelous. Yes, he was. He's coming out like that, yes. but, and everybody said, wow. But he was doing what I you told him. You gave him the idea. Yeah, now, That's great. this is about two days after I get a letter from him on his stationery, scratched in pencil, which I gave to the Kennedy Museum. And all he said on it was, how do you like your pupil? Love, Jack. Ah, oh, great, yes. You know. Then, Miss, m made you feel proud, must Oh, Marie sure. I was, uh, you're such a Marie nice Amsterdam. guy. Marie Amsterdam, uh, you you're keep talking about your wife yeah. a lot. How we did went, you meet that wonderful lady? We were lady? just married. Loved, we just celebrated our golden wedding, wedding anniversary. 50? 50 how years. How did you meet her? I want to tell you it's a wonderful way to get acquainted. <laughs> it certainly is. How My did you meet people you? say to me, does your wife have a good sense of humor? I does said, she? Don't be stupid. I said, sometimes... We get up two or three times during the night and just look at each other and laugh. <laughs> <laughs> no, How she's did you a good. I met her. She came to New York, and she was a Conover model. Uh -huh. And I happened to meet her on the day she came to New York, uh -huh. and that was it. We that were married it. the same year. Children? How many? We had uh, a boy and a girl. A boy and a girl. Yeah. Both in the business. No, my daughter is a psychologist. Really. And she does very very well. Uh huh. And she uh, and my son is in the production end of pictures and he and produces he produces yes. he writes and uh -huh. directs and so uh -huh. forth so they keep pretty busy and we have a very warm family thing we're always You're very together. close with your family aren't you Marie? oh sure maury amsterdam dick van dyke show everybody knows maury amsterdam buddy sorrell dick, that must have, tell me about dick van dyke how did you get that show well in the first place i must tell you people ask me they say was Dick drinking when he was on the show? <laughs> I'm not going to ask I you I said that. the most surprised oh. people in the world were people like Mary Tyler Moore and Rosie and I. We called each other. We never saw him take a drink. Uh -huh. If he did, he either started to drink after or something. Uh, you know, after right, this. of course. But we had never seen him take a never drink. Never took a drink. No. Isn't that wonderful? Maybe he did, but we never knew it. Right, right. But anyway, he is, I must tell you, one of the nice human beings I've ever worked with. In five years, but that went for the whole cast. Yes. We never, nobody ever had an argument. Nobody says, I should be doing that line. It was a kind Tight of... Tight family? When you say happy family, it sounds kind of cliche. Okay. But we really were, and we're still very good friends. I've known Rosie since she's uh, 12 years old. Yes, yes. You know, I wrote, I wrote her act. I'm, I wrote the act she still does. A great act she does. Yeah. I've seen with, it. With a four-girls right. four. Yeah. Four-girls four. It's great.
Mary Amsterdam. She, incidentally, she's my daughter's godmother. Is she? Yeah. Dick Van Dyke. You're saying wonderful things about him, and people are saying terrible things like that. But it is true. What kind he of is, terrible nah, things? They talk about he drinks and all that. Every, but that is the truth. What he does privately, that is what people do. I don't know if he's, if he's drinking today or not drinking. You never know. Uh -huh. We had a big birthday party for him this last year, and I never, still never that saw him take a drink. That show is still revamping forever constantly and ever. and ever and ever in many languages. I know. I've you ever seen, seen Maury Amsterdam talking? I've seen myself in seven different languages. Tell me about what's the favorite. Well, well, you know, I must tell you this. I decided to do a little investigation on my own. Right. And like if I saw it in Germany or Italy or someplace, uh -huh. I didn't look at the screen because I knew it was up there. I would look at the audience. And they always laughed and applauded in the right places. Did they really? So I knew that we did something right. Uh -huh. Which is the favorite? And we had great directors, great producers. We had Carl Reiner. He, he wrote the show you know, originally, uh -huh. you know, and uh, he's, he's a wonderful guy. Do you still people, do you still see the same people oh, all the time? Not all the time, but we see each other enough to know that we're living in the same town. Same town. <laughs> yeah. I see. But I must tell you, that's a funny, funny thing about, did you ever notice that? And I tell people sometimes, the reason I don't see it too often is because we live in the same town. Uh -huh. If you run into each other in Europe or some other place, hey, right, look right, who's here, right, right, make right. a whole big yeah, thing yeah, out of it. Right. But Carl, one day I must tell you, if yes. you notice, I never say anything bad about anybody anyway. I, and they, they kid me about it and always did. And one day, we're all sitting around at lunch talking. And it was one of those right. days where, uh, I don't know, everything, anybody right. or anything, they say, oh, that guy is a great talent. Uh -huh. He's a terrific guy, does a wonderful act, right? Finally, Carl Reiner looks at me, he said, for God's sake, he says, isn't there somebody you don't like? <laughs> I said, not right. that I can think of. You know he, why? Wait a minute. Go I ahead. Must finish. He said, what about Hitler? Well, I said, he wasn't one of my favorites, but you got to admit he was the best in his line, yeah. <laughs> which was the worst. Right, yeah. You, you were too close with Will Rogers. You and Will never liked it. Always the same. Always that the same. What never met what a man he didn't like. Well, he well, said it. Jim, but, always said that. But he maybe, but he maybe. I always get up about it. I said maybe you met somebody you could learn to dislike. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> cookbooks. Tell me about Maury Amsterdam cookbooks. You love to cook, Maury. No, I don't cook and I don't drink. Yeah. So I have a cookbook called Maury Amsterdam's Cookbook for Drinkers, or Betty Cooker's Crockbook. Right. Now I used to do it as a joke. This is the right. truth. And we're in some place in France or somewhere. My wife and I are having dinner. And I said, honey, look at this menu. Uh -huh. I said, 90% of the entrees are made with booze. Uh -huh. And the good chefs do use it for right. flavoring because the alcohol burns off. Right. And then I decided I'm going to get a collection. I got people like Janie Thomas's wife and uh, Jan Murray, all the guys whose wives right. were good cooks. And I give them credit in the book. And I wound up with about 300 great recipes all uh -huh. made with booze, uh -huh. you know? Not, no, not no drinking recipes, all different recipes made. And, I, and in the book, I've also got about... Jokes, drunks, jokes. About 300 drunk jokes. Drunk yeah. jokes. Yeah. If anyone wants those drunk jokes, buy Maury Amsterdam's books. It's great. It's a fun book. Yeah, I, I have it. it. I bought it from you. It's great. Oh, I you're the one. It. I'm the one. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, you're writing a book about your life, Maury Amsterdam. I'm writing an autobiography, and I mentioned you are? it to some idiot the other day. And I said, I'm doing an autobiography. He says, yeah. He said, who are you writing about? You know, people say stupid things without even thinking oh. as I'm writing about myself. Right. He said, when will it be finished? I said, I hope not for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, it's called I Remember Me. Uh -huh. And I've had such wonderful contacts uh -huh. with different people, that not only that I've written for, uh -huh. but people that I've met in our business. I know. And, and not, but just, I, I'm doing it in a series of vignettes instead of doing it chronologically. Right. Who cares what the name of the boat was my father came over on? I'm doing it... Nice, intimate stories about things that have happened with these people. Maury Amsterdam had a good time in his life right now. Would you say you've had I a good always, time? I always tell people I'm the happiest man I ever met. Good. And it's the truth. I got a Would wonderful you, family and I'm and I got good friends. Uh -huh. so Doing, looking back, would you do it the same way, Maury? Why not? If I could. Yeah. You would? Yeah, yeah. So Maury Amsterdam has I a good time. That, I think the main reason that people want to live a long time is to see what the hell's gonna happen next. Uh -huh. <laughs> I mean that. <laughs> And some of the things that are going on in the world kind of make you a little nuts. Does Maury Amsterdam believe in fate? Oh, sure. Do you sure. believe in fate? Of course. Why not? Everybody should believe in fate. We don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what's going to happen when you walk out this right. door. Right, right. So you're, are you spiritual? Spiritual? Mm. In what way? Do I believe in God? Well, yes. everything. I met him one day and he sneezed and I <laughs> didn't know what to say. 
Uh-huh. <laughs> no, you have I, compassion for others. I, I, I see you and your well, wife go out there and help other. You have an organization you go out, and you, you also golf. Oh, I somebody. do a lot. Of, but that, that do goes a lot for, of things. I must tell you, that goes for everybody in show business. Is they it really? Do, and you know, in true. some ways, it's unfair, and I'll tell you why. Right. This the committee, from who, I don't care who they are, if it's the City of Hope, all the people, and they come to you and they want them do them a favor. It's a wonderful organization, right. and it is. Uh -huh. And but they never stop to think, what happens if an actor is in a car and he's on his way to do that benefit, gets an accident, and winds up in the hospital? Right. They don't pay for it, and, and that goes for all benefits. If a man has got a clothing store and he donates twelve suits. Uh -huh to the charity, uh -huh. he can take that off his tax. Uh -huh. But performers, when they give, they give from they their give heart. heart yes. They really do. You said something very funny in the green room to me. You were telling me that wonderful story. Which one? You just, that beautiful story you were saying to me. I can't, re do you remember what you were telling me in the green room? No, I You were didn't. talking a lot in the green room, but you had a story in the green room. It was so funny. But about, no, I'll tell you. About Chicago. About the man oh, when that I was you working work for, for Al, Capone. Al Capone. Al Capone. He was my first boy, boss in a nightclub. And Al Capone. Tell yeah. me that story. Well, I was just a kid. I was about maybe 16 or 17 years old. And I had my first nightclub job. And my mother sent me to Chicago because she says, in San Francisco, there's no show business. You have to go east. Right. Well, to her east, they did, she didn't know that New York is east. She said, you've got to go to Chicago. And the main reason, she says, at least your grandmother lives there. I know you'll have something to eat. Right. See? But anyway, I'm working in this nightclub, Colosimo's. And Big Jim Colosimo had been rumored that, that Capone had shot him. I didn't know. Right. And, you know, a kid, you're 17 years old, everything's great. Now, I'm introduced to this man as Al Brown. They said he was uh -huh. in, from Indianapolis in the furniture business. And after about maybe six weeks, I found out he was Al Capone. And I looked at him. I said, are you Al Capone? He says, that's right. I said, gee, I didn't know you were in the cement business. <laughs> well, he got hysterical. Instead of getting mad, from then on, I was his buddy. He took care of me like I was his kid brother. Uh -huh. I went fishing with him, went on his yacht, everything else. And I even visited with him in Alcatraz. Uh -huh. I'm the only guy who ever, who ever took a show uh -huh. to Alcatraz. I got an idea. It was near Christmas time. And I called the warden, and I said, we'd like to bring a show over there. He said, we've never had a show in Alcatraz. Uh -huh. He said, I said, well, I think it'd be a good morale booster. I finally talked him into it. I got all the good acts who were playing around San Francisco. Right. We got in, he sent a little boat over for us. We went over there, and Al is sitting in the audience. And after the show, we went to the warden's office, and we talked. Uh -huh. And this is the truth. He had a little place out in Cicero. Uh -huh. And he used to send the guys with the nose, you know, right. <laughs> 2 o'clock after I could throw it at the club. And he said, come on, bring your cello. The boss wants to see you. Right. They'd take me out there, and he... And this, uh, I'm probably the only guy in the world he ever cooked for. Really? I used to sit there and play Italian uh -huh. tarantellas uh -huh. for him, you what know, on a cello. Uh -huh. Spaghetti and meatballs, Spaghetti what else? Meatballs. Sure. Really? So I, I have fond memories of that guy. People think I'm nuts, but it's the truth. Uh-huh. Dramatic actor. You won an award. Maury Amsterdam. Yeah, a lot of people don't know how great... Gunsmoke. Gunsmoke. Yeah. I played, I played an old drunken bum, and it oh, was one of the best wonderful. things I ever did. I'm going back in my mind. Oh, I'll tell you another... I remember that. It was another a, picture I played, and I'm very pleased, because every time it plays in the Late Show, but alongside my name, it says a brilliant performance. And that was a picture I made with Charlie Bronson called Machine Gun Kelly. Machine Gun Kelly. Yeah. You were wonderful in that. that you, was, comedy and dramatics, that runs together. Would you say, Well, Mary? it does, it's, particularly in one, in one particular way, and that's timing. That's why so many comics become good dramatic actors, right. but many dramatic actors can't do comedy. And there's a big difference between...